Welcome, and thank you for um, joining us today for this legislative briefing on successful aging in community, with a special emphasis on federal infrastructure to support aging services and priorities. The briefing is being recorded and will be emailed to all those who registered for this morning's briefing within the next two weeks. Please take a moment now to make sure your computer is on mute and we ask that you stay on mute during the briefing. My name is Rita Cortez. I'm the executive director of the Menorah Heritage Foundation, and I'm a participant in the Kansas City Region Leadership and Aging Network. It's my honor to host the sixth annual briefing on successful aging in community. Many of you from the Kansas City metro area have attended one or more of these briefings in the past, and we appreciate your continued interest. We are pleased to expand this year's briefing to include all state legislators from Kansas and Missouri. You'll see on the next slide that this briefing is sponsored by the Kansas City Region Leadership in Aging Network and the Missouri Age Association of Area Agencies on Aging. Members of these organizations listed on the slide focus on a wide variety of aging issues. With us today are the following members of today's planning committee. Dr. Lindsay Baker with the Missouri Budget Project, Kathy Boyer Schessel, Kansas City Community for All Ages with the Mid America Regional Council, Craig Eichelman with AARP Missouri, Deb Gwynn with the Platte County Senior Levy Fund, Julie Jordan with Senior Age, Jan Keith with Aging Ahead, Ernie Cutsley with AARP Kansas, Julie Peets with the Missouri Age Association of Area Agencies on Aging, Jamie Saunders with St. Louis Area Agency on Aging, and Dr. James Stowe with the Department of Aging and Adult Services at Mark. Before we begin today's briefing, I would like to introduce legislators in attendance. I'll state your name, state, and districts as I see you on the screen. Please feel free to enter into chat any additional information you would like the group to know about yourself. With us, and to, the people we anticipate will be with us today are the following from the state of Missouri Senator Steve Roberts, Senator Jill Shoup, um, Representative LaDonna Applebaum, representing the 71st District in St. Louis County, Representative Donna, Donna Berenger with District 82 in St. Louis City, Representative Ingrid Burnett, District, 82, uh, District 19 in Kansas City. Repres Representative Phil Cristofanelli with District 105 in St. Charles County. Representative Joe Dahl with District 83 in St. Louis City and County. Representative Trish Gunby, District 99, St. Louis County. Representative Ann Kelly, District 127, Barton, Dade, and parts of Jasper and Cedar Counties. Representative Patty Lewis, District 25, Kansas City area. Representative Ian Mackey, District 87, St. Louis County. Representative Tracy McCreary, District 88, St. Louis County. Representative Peggy McGaw, District 39, Kansas City area. Representative Maggie Nuremberg, District 15 in the Kansas City area. Representative Michael O'Donnell, District 95, St. Louis County. Representative Louis Riggs, District 5, which is Hannibal area, Marion, Shelby, and parts of Monroe counties. Representative Sarah Unsicker, District 91, St. Louis County and City. Representative Kevin Windham, District 85, St. Louis County. And joining us from the Kansas side, uh, we anticipate Senator Beverly Gossage, District 9, which is Kansas City area. Senator, sorry, Senator Beverly Gossage, District 9, Kansas City Metro. Senator Mary Ware, District 25, Sedgwick County, Wichita. Representative Chris Croft, District 8, Kansas City area. Representative Pam Curtis, District 32, Kansas City area. Representative Joe Hoy, District 17, Kansas City area. Representative Cindy Neighbor, District 18, Kansas City area. Representative Jared Owsley, District 24, Kansas City area. Representative Chuck Schmidt, District 88, Sedgwick County, Wichita area, and Representative Charlotte Esau, District 14 in the Kansas City area. We truly want to thank each and every one of you for joining us today 
Um, before we, before, as we move on, give me one moment here, too many pieces of paper. Um, we wanna thank you for your work during this past session. We know that the pandemic continues to present very difficult challenges. As we move through today's briefing, please feel free to ask questions in the chat box at any time. To, time is scheduled for questions and discussion at the conclusion of today's briefing. Your questions will be monitored and raised at the end of the discussion. Please advance to the next, to slide four. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Julie Peets, Executive Director with the Missouri Association of Area Agencies on Aging, who will provide an overview of older adult demographics in both Kansas and Missouri. Thank you, Rita. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us today. We truly appreciate your time and attention to these important issues impacting successful aging in Missouri and Kansas. As with previous briefings, it's important to highlight the projected demographic shift of older adults over the next two decades in Kansas and Missouri. You will see the dramatic growth in our older population. On this slide, you can please advance to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. On this slide, you can see two maps of Kansas showing the dramatic difference in our older adult population between 2010 and 2030. Counties in yellow are those with the 25% or greater population of people 65 and older. Other counties are shown in shades of blue, progressing from a dark shade, less than 10% of the population being 65 and older, to lighter shades showing incrementally higher percentages of residents 65 and older. In Kansas, 30 counties will have a population of 25% or greater of residents 65 and older, and that's an increase from just eight counties in 2010. Only one county will have less than 10% of residents 65 and older. In 2030, 29% of the counties in Kansas are projected to have a population of with 25% or greater of residents 65 and older. Next slide to Missouri, please. In Missouri, we see 40 counties with a population of 25% or greater of residents 65 and older. And that's up from just two counties in 2010 and only one county will have less than 10% of residents 65 and older. In 2030, 35% of Missouri counties are projected to have a 25% or greater population of residents 65 and older. The growth in our population of 65 and older is growing at a dramatic rate. And also it's important to point out that as the challenges related to the pandemic continue, our older adults older adults continue to be disproportionately impacted. Please remember that if you have questions during this morning's briefing, please add them to the chat. Thank you again for your time this morning. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Lindsay Baker, Research Director for the Missouri Budget Project. Lindsay will provide information about the status of federal funding. Thank you. Thanks, Julie, and thanks everyone for being here today. Um, as Julie said, my name is Lindsay Baker, and I am the research director for the Missouri Budget Project. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with our organization, uh, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that focuses on budget, tax, economic, and health policy in Missouri. Um, for those of you on the Kansas side, we do have a sister organization in Kansas, which is Kansas Action for Children. And today I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about the opportunity provided by the recent influx of federal funds into both Kansas and Missouri and, and really across to states across the country. Um, for those of you who have questions on the Kansas side, I'll do my best to answer those um, at the end, um, but also Ernie probably from AARP will be able to answer some of those questions as well. And I'll be sure to provide contact information for our sister organization in Kansas for those of you who have follow-ups on the Kansas side. 
Um, but just um, so everyone is clear as I'm moving through this information, um, I'm going to really be talking about information that applies primarily to both Kansas and Missouri as I move through this presentation. I'll be giving some Missouri specific examples. The vast majority of what I'm talking about is really going to be similar in both Kansas and Missouri. So as Julie mentioned, we know that the population of both Kansas and Missouri is aging. And that does present um, some challenges when you're talking about crafting a state budget. We know that the need for services inc is increasing given the aging population, um, but we also know that there's ways to contain those costs as well. Um, ensuring that seniors have the services that they need in order to remain in their homes and communities is critical, um, in part because uh, remaining in homes and communities is preferable to seniors and their families. Um, but I also want to point out that it's really preferable from a state budgeting perspective as well. The longer seniors can remain in their homes and communities, um, it is you know, less time that they spend potentially in a more expensive and more restrictive setting like a nursing home. And so you know, really it's preferable both for people um, and the state budget at the same time. So ensuring that those services are fully funded that allow people to remain and function in their own homes and communities is critically important. Yet the majority of services um, that are designed to serve seniors um, that are housed within state budgets um, are, have really remained stagnant over the past several years. Um, and you know, those, those um, services in addition, in some cases have actually been cut, not just remain stagnant, but have actually been cut over the years. Um, couple of, of examples of this, we know that a few years ago, budget constraints in Missouri meant that um, prescription drug services for seniors provided through MoRx, as well as eligibility for home and community-based services uh, was cut. Um, eligibility for MoRx has been restored since then, um, but the appropriation in order to actually provide those services has not been restored. Similarly, um, the Senior Growth and Development Fund, which was created in Missouri to address some of those um, increases in funding needed to address um, the growth in needed services. Um, those funds were created, um, but again, because of budget constraints, um, those, um, uh, the program has not been fully funded and has remained, funds have remained restricted. Um, so really what we, you know, what we need to see is um, an investment in those services that in the long run um, are really going to save the state money. Um, and what we have at this point, because of that influx in federal funding that we've seen, um, both due to stimulus bills and potentially other bills, federal bills that could pass in the future, um, though that influx of federal funds really gives us an, kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity to be able to make those once, once in a lifetime investments in both Missourians and Kansans, um, as well as seniors and their families in those. So today I'm going to be talking about those federal bills, both that have already passed and those that we expect to pass, and the impact the funding from those bills could have on seniors and their families within our state. So if you could move to the next slide now. Oh, I'm sorry, move back one more slide. I didn't realize they'd already advanced. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, the stimulus packages um, that have already passed. So um, we know that several federal stimulus packages, the Families First Act, CARES Act, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, and finally the American Rescue, Rescue Plan have been passed in the past year and a half or so. And those plans included significant funding that flowed directly through state budgets. Those packages kept dollars flowing through local communities at a time when the need for services increased dramatically. Um, at the same time that state and local budgets were strained. So they've really kept those services afloat um, during that time. Most of those stimulus bills, um, the funding has been appropriated or spent with the exception largely of the funds provided through the American Rescue Plan. Um, and that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. So this first slide shows um, those, that first bucket of funds that's provided through the American Rescue Plan um, which is um, the bucket of funds that um, goes toward uh, flexible state and local fiscal relief. Um, and so when you look at the state portion of those funds, um, 
what you see is that there's a significant amount of fairly flexible funding um, in Kansas and Missouri that's going to need to be appropriated primarily in the next session or two. Um, I, I wanna point out um, for Missouri specifically, um, this slide says 2.8 billion, that was the original estimate. It ended up being actually closer to about $2.7 billion that's coming directly to the state. Um, in Missouri, that is going to be coming in two tranches. So we've received the first half of that funding um, and are waiting on the second half of that funding to come later. So as of right now, we've really only received about half of that. Um, again, uh, most of the, that funding remains to be allocated. There's a small portion that has already been allocated in both states, but the bulk of that funding um, remains to be allocated. Um, it must be obligated by the end of 2024, um, and the funds must be fully spent by the end of 2026. So um, those funds um, are temporary, but we do have a fair amount of time in which um, to be able to actually spend those funds. They don't have to be spent immediately. They could be spread out a bit, um, but they do need to be spent entirely by the end of the year. Those could be spent um, to respond to the COVID pandemic or the resulting negative, negative economic effects. They can be spent to provide premium pay to essential public workers. Uh, they can be spent to provide services equivalent to the amount of revenue lost due to the pandemic. Um, and they can be spent in order to invest in improvements to water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure. Um, states cannot use these funds to reduce tax revenues, provide tax cuts, or fund pensions. And so in, in terms of these specific funds, um, our states really do have a once in a lifetime chance to use these funds to invest in Missourians um, and Kansans and set us up for a future that provides greater opportunity for all of us, both rural and urban and within every community, no matter the zip code. And with this vision in mind, um, the Missouri Broad Budget Project has brought together over a hundred organizations from across the state that represent diverse sectors. Um, and we came together to identify priorities for the investment of these ARPA funds across um, several key areas. Um, these priorities represent the many areas in which Missouri can make transformative one-time investments that can address the health and economic consequences of the pandemic and build toward a better and more equitable future for all Missourians. So I'm not gonna take time right now um, to go through all of those different recommendations, but I will highlight a few things that came out of that process that we went through um, with service providers and advocates across the state um, that, that highlight um, the kinds of opportunities that we have to provide services um, to seniors um, and others in our state. Um, so one uh, of uh, the opportunities that came up um, for investment is investing in state IT systems to ensure clients and staff can access information and make transactions easily and quickly, and to ensure departments and programs can easily share information. Um, we know that Missouri systems are very outdated and being able to invest in these systems would um, help state departments run more efficiently and better be able to serve those clients who rely on those services provided by the state. I'm sure this is the case in Kansas as well. Um, and this really does provide us the opportunity to make that one-time invest investment that would really be a game changer in years to come. Um, another opportunity that was identified as part of this process is um, to, to make workforce investments in high turnover fields due to COVID, um, including, but not limited to home health care aids and personal care aids. Um, so we know that there's been a great amount of turnover and burnout in those fields and being able to ensure that we have enough people in that field and others to be able to serve the people that um, they care about is incredibly important. And finally, another, um, another priority that was identified related to seniors specifically um, is to plug gaps in funding um, that we see related to an increase um, in victims of crime, um, including elder abuse, domestic violence, um, and other things like child abuse related to the pandemic. We know that there's some temporary shortfall in VOCA funding, which is the victims of crime funding um, that comes, comes down from the federal from a federal grant and being able to plug those gaps um, to be able to address those increases in those things that we saw during the pandemic would be another great way to invest in people across our state. And next slide, please. Okay. 
Okay. So the next thing I wanna talk about is the second bucket of funding that remains to be appropriated from the American Rescue Plan. So there's a significant amount of earmarked funding in both Kansas and Missouri. Um, this, uh, this funding has less flexibility. Generally, these um, uh, funds flow through particular, um, particular pots in the budget that already exist, um, but they do need to be formally appropriated in order to be drawn down. This is an, an exhausted list, exhaustive list of those funding. Um, not included in this slide are things like public health funding um, that's meant to address public health workforce shortages. Um, there's also mental health funding that's going to be drawn down and a range of other types of funding that, that the state could draw on um, in order to support services in those areas. I do want to highlight a couple of things that we have on this slide. First is that um, we do um, the American Rescue Plan does provide enhanced Medicaid match for states who are implementing Medicaid expansion as an incentive to uh, um, implement Medicaid expansion. And I want to be clear that Missouri does qualify for this, even though we had passed Medicaid expansion at the ballot, bug, uh, ballot box before, um, before this bill was passed, we had not actually formally implemented Medicaid expansion. So, Medicare, so Missouri would be able to draw on that $1.15 billion in enhanced Medicaid match funds um, that are tied to that Medicaid expansion. Kansas has not passed Medicaid expansion, but if it were to do that in the next few years, Kansas would be able to draw down those federal dollars as well. Um, and, you know, one of the things about the Medicaid expansion match rate here is that those enhanced funds um, will free up general revenue that's currently spent on Medicaid, will free up those funds to be spent on other funds within the state budget and other services that need to be um, funded within the state budget. I also want to highlight home and community-based services funds um, that were included in here. There were additional funds for home and community-based services um, that were included in the American Rescue Plan. These funds um, need to be appropriated within one year. So we'll get an, an additional one year of an enhanced FMAP for those home and community-based services. This is a little bit different than the enhanced match for Medicaid expansion in that those additional funds actually have to be used to supplement existing services. They can't be used to pay for or replace those funds for existing services. It actually has to be an increase in services or um, related funding sources. So that's a little bit different. Again, this is one year of funding, but as I'm gonna talk about um, in, in the next slide, there are some opportunities to be able to continue this funding into the future. And this is really critically important because we know that home and community-based services are really a much more cost-effective option um, at keeping people in their homes and communities um, in the long run than providing those same services within a more restricted setting like a nursing home. So it's really critical that we're able to encourage people to stay in their homes and communities from a budgeting perspective. So if you could move to the next slide. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about next um, quickly is um, the Build Back Better um, plan and the potential for additional home and community-based services that could be coming to both Missouri and Kansas if the um, Build Back Better plan were to pass. So currently in that plan as it exists, what we see is um, additional funding to expand and improve home and community-based service. Um, this would um, include an additional um, enhanced federal match rate. It's not as large as the enhanced match rate that was, was included in the American Rescue Plan, but it would be structured in a very similar way. Instead of an additional 10 percentage points in enhanced match rate, we'd be looking at an additional six percentage points in enhanced match rate. But this would be a much more permanent and long-term enhanced match as compared to the American Rescue Plan, which is very temporary match rate. This plan also includes grants for workforce recruitment and retention in the home and community-based services workforce. Um, it includes um, additional funding for the state to um, plan for what those enhancements home and community-based services might be and to cover the cost of administration related to those additional funds. And it would make a special impover impoverishment protections included in home and community-based services permanent, as well as making money follows the program, uh, program permanent 
um, which is a program that transitions people from nurse, nursing homes back into the communities and has been shown to save a significant amount of um, funding in the state budget. Next slide, please. Um, quickly, a few other provisions related to seniors here in the Build Back Better plan um, that could have a big impact on our states. Um, first, the Build Back Better plan would um, enact a temporary, another a temporary expansion of our, the earned income tax credit um, to people 65 plus. It would, it would um, expand this through 2022. It would also extend marketplace subsidies, which are really helpful to those people who are not old enough to qualify for Medicare, but are really on that shoulder age where um, they have very high costly plans that would extend those subsidies, subsidies through the end of 2025 and would provide an additional enhanced match rate for states who have expended Medicaid coverage um, that would be um, in existence from 2023 to until 2025. And to be clear here, Missouri was able to, through the American Rescue Plan, take advantage of those funds that were to incentivize Medicaid expansion. But because at this point we have actually implemented Medicaid expansion, we would also be able to take advantage of these enhanced Medicaid match rates for those states who currently have Medicaid. Um, expansion in place. So we'd be able to take advantage of both those enhanced um, match rates. So if you could advance to the final slide. So altogether, what this means is the influx of federal funds into Kansas and Missouri provides a once in a light, once in a generation opportunity to invest in people in Missouri and Kansas and set our states up to be a leader in years to come. Um, now, Missouri Budget Project provides several resources that may be of use. Um, each year around the state of the um, state of the state, we put together a senior budget primer, which um, follows senior budget um, items and um, helps, you know, it's kind of a deep dive into um, how those items are funded and where they are housed within the state budget. We expect that will be released in late January. Um, we also are in the process of developing a senior budget tracker which follows those funds in the state budget over time and are in the process of putting together a brief on property tax relief for seniors as well, which we anticipate will be available. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, I wanna remind you, please put any questions you have for me in the chat and do feel free to reach out with any follow-up questions. And you can see on this slide, I've, I've had my contact info up here as well as contact information for our sister organization in Kansas. So now I'll turn it over to Craig Eichelman, who is, Eichelman, who is the AARP Missouri State Director, and Ernie Cutsley, who is the AARP Kansas Advocacy Director. Um, and they will be sharing some really important information developed by AARP. So thanks again for your time. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for uh, being here. Uh, I'm as introduced, I'm Craig Eichelman. I'm the director in Missouri for AARP, and I'm joined by uh, Ernie Cutsley, uh, the advocacy director in Kansas for AARP. And we're going to be talking about the uh, long-term care, the impact of the pandemic on long-term care, uh, and then we'll also be talking about the bipartisan infrastructure framework and how that money is going to flow uh, into Kansas in Missouri. So if you can advance to the next slide, please. Um, uh, the pandemic has hit nursing homes the hardest, clearly. Uh, the numbers we're going to share with you uh, here over the next few minutes, and they're going to come kind of quick, but we'll, we'll give you some time to absorb them. They come from the AARP nursing home dashboard, which measures these uh, percentages that we'll share with you. A new one comes out later this month, and we'll be happy to uh, share that dashboard report uh, uh, with with anyone who 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 would like that uh, information. So, if you can advance to the next slide, uh, in Kansas, uh, thirty percent of the COVID deaths in the state uh, happened in nursing homes, with over eighteen hundred residents and nine staff. Next slide. In Missouri, that is about 32% of, of all the deaths from COVID happened in, uh, happened in nursing home with residents and staff, uh, over 3,800 uh, residents and nearly 70 staff uh, have, have uh, 
died from the from the COVID virus. What's interesting about the numbers is the staff and residents in the nursing home. That represents less than one percent of Missouri's population, yet uh, attributes nearly a third of all deaths uh, in in the state to COVID. So there's a, a glaring a glaring concern here. And Ernie, you're you're up, you're up on the next slide, please. Thank you, Craig, and thanks everyone for being with us today. Appreciate it. So because of the uh, the high death rate and the high uh, rates of uh, turnover in the nursing homes. In August, AERP issued a press release calling for nursing homes to require vaccinations for staff and residents. Uh, we felt that the low levels of staff vaccinations in, in particular create an unacceptable level of risk since the disease spread so easily in these environments. In the November nursing home report, we saw that 87% of Missouri nursing home residents had been fully vaccinated. Next slide, please. And in Kansas, 88% of the nursing home residents have been fully vaccinated. Next slide, please. We also saw that 58% of the Missouri nursing home staff are fully vaccinated. Next slide. And 67% of the nursing home staff in Kansas are fully vaccinated. Next slide, please. Um, also this year, data became available for staffing levels at Kansas and Missouri nursing homes on the dashboard. The Nursing Home Reform Act of 87 requires that a minimum nursing facility, at a minimum nursing facilities provide eight hours of registered nurse coverage and 24 hours of licensed practical nurse coverage per day. Uh, in Kansas, no, in Missouri, I'm sorry, in Missouri, we saw that nursing homes report a shortage in nurses and aides at 39%. Next slide, please. And in Kansas, 58% of the nursing homes report a shortage in nursing home aides and nurses. Um, we know at the Kansas Senior Care Task Force, which just met the last two days, uh, staffing levels and shortages of workforce uh, was a major issue. So if you look at solutions, the next, next slide, please. Um, we believe that uh, to vaccinate all staff in long-term care facilities is necessary, making sure that there's high quality PPE equipment for available for everyone, uh, maintaining safe family visitation guidelines, and expanding transitional programs, such as rebalancing long-term care. And we know in Kansas that Kansas ranks 47th in nursing home residents with low care needs still in nursing homes, according to our 2020 ARP long-term care services and support scorecard. Next slide, please. Back to Craig, I believe. Yeah, uh, it, just uh, one, one more solution to, to add is to make uh, full use of funding for expansion of home and community-based services uh, from the CARES Act, American Rescue Plan, and the proposed uh, Build Back Better Plan uh, to fully fund HCBS, home and community-based service contracts to prevent wait times in, in the system. Uh, last year, uh, a line item in the budget for home and community-based services uh, got an increase of 5.3%. That's the most ever. Uh, this coming year, there'll, there'll need to be an additional 5% increase in funding. If it remains flat, uh, the people who hold who have these contracts for home and community pay service services would not even be able to afford to pay minimum wage to, to folks uh, uh, offering the services. So it's very important that that, that, that gets expanded uh, so folks can take advantage of, of being cared for in the community rather than in a more expensive setting. We need to uh, also trans transition low need residents out of nursing homes. Um, in Missouri and in Kansas, I mean, the acuity rate is some of the highest in the country where nearly one in four uh, people don't need to be in that institutional setting. They can be cared for in, in, the, in, the, in the community with some, with some basic services. Uh, that uh, 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 
that can be assisted also with uh, fully funding area agencies on aging to provide those wraparound services so people can remain independent in their homes. Examples would be home delivered meals, non-emergency transport, et cetera. Those are the things that allow someone to remain independent and not have to be institutionalized. And I think that was it on, on that. Next slide, please. This is sort of a pu pushing in the clutch and shifting gears, talking about the, the bipartisan infrastructure framework uh, that, that was just passed. And next slide, please. We'll talk about how, how some of these dollars uh, are going to flow into Missouri, as you can, and, and into Kansas. I'll, I'll talk about Missouri here for a second, and Ernie will uh, kind of transition over to the Kansas numbers. But the uh, bipartisan infrastructure uh, bill for Missouri is over $9 billion are going to flow in to uh, Missouri over the next five to seven years. You can see the vast majority of those dollars are in highway funds and bridge repair and replacement. Uh, there's also quite a chunk for uh, for public transportation. And that goes, that money is going to flow directly to localities. So be a formula, uh, formula for, uh, for applying for those funds through the rural area uh, uh, transmission grant, uh, transportation grants that will be directly to, that will go directly to municipalities. So municipalities will apply for these grants. And there's a, there's a, you know, over, nearly $700 million for that. Um, there'll be also be a chunk for electronic vehicle charging network uh, for across our states, uh, which is, you know, I think pe people generally think if you're an electronic electric vehicle, you maybe you live in, you know, Kansas City or Missouri, you know, wh why is this important for rural, uh, our rural communities? But if I, if I can't get from Kansas City to um, Denver on a on one charge, where, where am I going to charge my vehicle? So there's going to be this network that's going to be necessary to be built out uh, throughout our states to to accommodate uh, to accommodate all this. Of course, uh, uh, there's a chunk in here for uh, for broadband as well. Uh, we're already uh, working with we AARP is already working with. Um, the governor's office on a broadband mapping project to find out where where broadband is and where it isn't. Um, of course, broadband is very important for you know. I, I remember being in an AARP meeting where we felt we had to be a champion of of uh, telehealth, and uh, someone smartly said we better be a cha champion of broadband infrastructure first in order to make telehealth available. And it goes down uh, for airport infrastructure as well, and water infrastructure for sewer, uh, drinking and storm water. Uh, as an example, St. Louis and Kansas City and other large uh, communities have have massive uh, uh, water infrastructure uh, programs already, uh, replacement programs already in motion. Uh, this is going to be a big help because it will. Uh, uh, it will impact, it will have a positive impact on rates uh, for, uh, for consumers who will not be, you know, this, this plan will help uh, under, will help uh, pay for a lot of these big programs instead of the water companies putting that in themselves and then billing it back to, to consumers. So uh, a win-win there. And if we go, go to the next slide, uh, Ernie will talk about Kansas. Thank you, Craig. So as you can see on the slide, and I want to go through all the numbers, Kansas will, could receive $3,839,000,000, uh, a lot of money, and that's broken down uh, 2600000 for highway funds, $225 million for bridges and replacement, bridge repair and replacement, which we know if we drive around uh, Kansas and or Missouri, that the roads and the bridges are certainly uh, in need of some tremendous quick repairs. Uh, if we look at uh, broadband infrastructure, 100 million minimum, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a, in a moment, uh, but we know from just the 
meetings that we've had in the last couple of days across the state that broadband connectivity drops and picks back up depending on usage. Um, and I live outside of Lawrence, just still on the main line, but uh, on any given day it's spotty and that's, that's tough working from home when you have to do that. Um, and the water infrastructure, about 454 million. And as Craig said, helps to replace water lines and, and systems that haven't been replaced in years. Uh, we have some volunteers in Hayes a couple of years ago that the Hayes decided to replace uh, the system and tacked on a, a significant number of dollars to their water bills to help pay for the system. So. So the 454 million in Kansas will help greatly, I believe. So next slide, please. Greg, back to you, sir. Greg, you're on mute. Someone had to be first, right? To be on mute and talking. So I, I get to wear that button. Um, so uh, purpose and timing uh, is to address the economic impacts of pandemic through traditional infrastructure spending uh, and to address the economic issues amplified by the pandemic, such as broadband access. So uh, much of the spending will be spread out over uh, the next, uh, it says five to 10 years here, so five to seven years to allow construction planning, timing, and trained workforce uh, limitations. So I think there's an opportunity to think about uh, direct training programs through the state and through our community college system to, to prepare a workforce for this infrastructure uh, infusion. And last year's passage in Missouri of the gasoline tax increase, it, it allows the state of Missouri to take full advantage of uh, highway and budget funds. Um, if we hadn't done that, Missouri would not have been able to pay our match. And we now can uh, take advantage of all the transportation funds um, uh, destined for Missouri. Next slide. So we wanted to talk a little bit more about public transportation funds. Kansas and Missouri receive an estimated 949 million total in transportation funds used to improve healthy, sustainable transportation options. 32% of transit vehicles in Missouri and 12% in Kansas are past their useful lives. And Missouri ranks 44th in investment in public transportation of all 50 states. If you take what Missouri uh, spends on public transit, it invests about nine cents per capita uh, per year in, in transit. Now, with the uh, with with the new with the transportation dollars that will be flowing into Missouri, it'll be about 135 million a year over the next five years. So that increases what we traditionally spent nine cents per capita to 19 dollars per capita, and this is money that will be used all over the state, not just uh, St. Louis and and Missouri. I mean, this goes towards Oats buses and transports in rural communities as well. Uh, so it'll be spent all over the state. Next slide. So this is just a quick overview of, of how the dollars will be spread out uh, uh, between now and 2025. Take a second to soak that in. And we'll go to, to the next slide and back to Ernie. Thank you, Craig. Yep. So speaking of broadband again, uh, Missouri and Kansas will each receive a minimum allocation of 100 million for broadband infrastructure expansion. Missouri Department of Economic Development and the Federal Communications Commission are preparing to launch mapping programs to identify gaps in broadband services. And in Kansas and Missouri, uh, in, in Missouri, 26% of the state are 1,600,000 Missourians. And in Kansas, 669,000 Kansas, or approximately 24%, will be eligible for the Affordability Connectivity Benefit, formerly EBB. The assistance will be $30 per month to help lower income families afford high-speed internet to be able to 
connect with education, healthcare, and loved ones. In a recent survey that we just did, AARP Kansas, we found that 61% of those surveyed use the internet for health-related reasons, uh, keeping folks home, uh, especially in this time of COVID, very important for safety. And we did see a distribution uh, between um, high-speed internet versus 53% versus rural versus 27% non-rural saying that they had internet problems at any given time. And then we, we saw that, or we see that 76% of those surveyed agree that elect, elected officials in Kansas should work to ensure that high-speed internet is available to all Kansas, regardless of where they live. So a lot of work to be done and a lot of money to be, to be allocated to that work. Thank you. Back to you, Craig. You're muted, Craig. Man, twice in one day. Here we go. Uh, drinking water and wastewater infrastructure. Uh, Missouri will receive approximately 866 million and Kansas uh, 454 million for water improvements over five over the next five years. So as I stated earlier, uh, Missouri has severely aging water infrastructure and in most of its long established uh, metropolitan areas, both Kansas City and St. Louis, have initiated multi-billion dollar projects to update uh, stormwater and sewage. And uh, while that is good, that is also uh, puts a lot of stress on ratepayers who will see an increase in, in their uh, water bills. But, uh, you know, having this federal dollars flow in to support these projects will affect um, uh, will positively affect uh, the rates for 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 uh, for uh, stormwater and, and sewage uh, in in uh, in those particular markets. So uh, that is all Ernie and I have. We'll be happy to uh, answer any questions you 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 have about uh, long term care or or the uh, new infrastructure bill dollars. And from here, I'm going to toss it back to Rita. So first, I want to take a moment to thank our uh, presenters, uh, Lindsey Baker, Craig Eichelman, and Ernie Cutsley, along with Julie Peets, um, for their time in, in both preparing and now for, for answering any questions that you might have. Uh, we really would like to hear from you, so please use the, the box if you have questions. Um, one of the, or to share what you're hearing from your constituents um, that might be relevant to our work in the older adult space. Um, one of the questions that's been presented um, is whether there are any ideas on the table for infrastructure funds to be used to reduce fossil fuel dependency. Uh, Representative Burnett posed that in the in the chat, and uh, I would I would ask uh, any of our presenters if they'd like to to kind of uh, share uh, their observations on that question. This is Craig Eichelman from AARP. I you know, I'm not an expert on, on on that part, but there there are line items for the electronic vehicle recharging uh, uh, network across states for, in urban and rural areas, uh, and that's to um, you know that's being put in place to in, in anticipation of more electronic electric vehicles being being sold uh, and and make it easier and more convenient. Uh, for people to recharge in whether they're you know driving across the country or going up to Chillicothe or 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 Weston uh, uh, whatever so that's that's the that's the one thing that sort of stands out for me I'll let I'll let others comment um Lindsay if you I don't know if you have any observations on uh representative Burnett's question regarding infrastructure uh, and fossil fuel, but uh, the other question related to um, the projections on how on the impact of pandemic deaths uh, related to the projections on population increases over 65. Would you like to uh, share some thoughts on that? Sure, sure. So in terms of the infrastructure, I don't really have anything to add. Um, AARP is the experts on that, so I'll I'll let them take that question. So I don't really have anything to add there. 
Um, in terms of whether there are projections on how the rate of uh, pandemic deaths impacts the projected increase in population over 65. Um, others may have uh, more to add on this, so feel free to jump in the other speakers if you have information on this. But um, from my perspective, um, what I would say is I don't think we really have great projections on this yet. I would expect that it does have some impact, um, whether it's big enough, large enough to really have, you know, a substantive impact is a different question. Um, certainly, we've seen, you know, uh, uh, life expectancy go down, um, but whether that really has, um, you know, a substantive impact on the general share of the population and um, the need for services as that population grows is a different question, and I think that that's less clear. Um, and as far as official projections, I am not aware of any. Um, I would say just from a budgeting perspective, it's been um, while there might be, um, you know, a decrease in numbers with the projections, there's also an increase in cost of providing services to the pandemic. So just in terms of a strict budgetary perspective, just because there are, you know, might be a decrease in numbers of seniors or share of seniors doesn't necessarily also translate to um, decreased costs within the budget. That's my perspective. There may be um, information that AARP or, um, or uh, MA4 wants to add to that. Julie, anything that you'd like to 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 share observation wise? Kind of my unmute button. Um, no, I think uh, Lindsay, you make a really good point. I think um, even if I, I think you very well said there. Thank you. So, uh, Craig and Ernie, um, if, if you have any observations about the the impact of pandemic deaths, if you'd add that, um, I'm also going to ask you to address uh, Representative Lewis's question about. Uh, HPCS uh, funding and the AARP's position regarding adult day services. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in and then uh, Ernie, you feel free to, to, to add. Yeah, I mean, the adult day services is, is a component of home and community-based services. I, you know, it's something that allows someone to remain uh, in the community outside of a, a a skilled nursing uh, uh, facility that they may, that they may not need. Uh, as, as we said, the numbers are you know one in four uh, people in the nursing home today, uh, you know could could function successfully outside of a nursing home in the community if they have those wraparound supports. You know, I always use the example, you know, my mom doesn't need to be institutionalized. I just don't want her to burn the kitchen down when she cooks breakfast. You know, so what are what are those supports in the community that will help her be successful and live independently uh, for as long as uh, she can? So for for some, uh, that answer might be, you know, a, a daycare setting that allows a, a uh, the adult child to, you know, go to work and know that a parent is being safely cared for um, and, and being able to socially interact with other other people uh, during the day and come home, um, uh, you know, later in the day and, and where, where they want to be. So you, a, it's it's it's. Uh, if you want to just think about it in terms of money, it's much less expensive than being in a nursing home, uh, which is basically Medicaid supported. So that's state's paying for that. So, um, uh, but the outcome is better. I mean, per, that person is where they are, they where they want to be, they're in their community, uh, friends, family, all that. So you, you, uh, it's a, it's a win-win. So Ernie, is there anything you'd, you'd add to that? I would just I would just say when we look at transitioning folks out of the nursing homes that it really takes community to make community based services. So whether you're looking at daycare, adult daycare or other programs, it, it takes uh, more than just one or two people. And I think as we saw in the slides um, that the shortages of staff and nurses and aides and nursing homes also rolls out into the community where we see shortages of home health care workers, shortages of workers at adult daycare centers and everywhere. So uh, it's really important for us, Kansas, Missouri, and all states to, to work on and figure out how to best 
implement programs, projects, efforts to reduce uh, the lack of staffing or to increase the staffing ratios at uh, all centers for um, seniors in Kansas, Missouri, and states. So, uh, Lindsay, I'm going to I'm going to ask you to um, start the conversation around the question from uh, Jamie Opsel with regard to um, the Senior Growth and Development Fund in Missouri. Sure. Um, I don't know if I have a full answer to this. So basically, the question is, you know, why is the Senior Growth and Development Fund? Um, why is that um, funding being withheld? I don't know that I have a full answer to that. What I will say that, that I know is that it's a new program. It is not that uncommon when there are budget uh, constraints for funding for a newer program to be withheld versus making cuts to um, other programs. Um, and so, you know, I'm not sure I have much more insight into why those restrictions have been made. Others on this call may, so I'll give the opportunity for others comment, but my understanding is is most likely it's it's kind of that process where there's a new program. If there's not um, funds to support that within the budget, if there are constraints, then usually it's those those new programs that have funds restricted first. Um, others may have more to add. Though. This is Craig. I, I, I don't. So it's a good open ended open question. So um, if, the, if anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to, to put them in the chat. We know, um, you know in our work across a lot of different dimensions that the workforce issues um, that, that many of our speakers uh, have talked about are, um, you know, the, those exist across the, the continuum uh, within our, our current economy and, uh, you know, creative strategies are gonna be, are gonna be helpful, I think, um, and, and we're going to need to engage those conversations. We may be in the older adult space, but the, uh, but the workforce issues are, are pressing from, you know, early childhood all the way up through the, the, the last stages of senior care. So um, we, we're happy to be a partner in those conversations if the opportunities present. Um, I do, um, if there are no additional questions, I'm going to uh, ask uh, for the next slide to advance. Um, Included in this deck are, um, and that will be shared with you, are a variety of resources that you should, you legislators should feel free to um, access at any time. Um, we have 10 area agencies on aging in the state of Missouri that cover a variety of geographies. Um, that information will be provided to you. Um, the next slide shows the 11 area agencies on aging in the state of Kansas. Again, um, these are these folks who who work directly with uh, senior programs are great resources uh, as you have questions um, and 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 frankly as you have constituents who are in need of of support and uh, strategies. Um, the next slide uh, includes the list of sponsors of uh, today's briefing, and along with their contact information. Each of us work in different areas um, in the aging space and would be happy to be resources to you in your work. Uh, we know that oftentimes questions come up either as you're contemplating uh, issues for legislation or debate, or as you're simply wrestling with how do we do something differently or better. We are happy, uh, all of us on this list are happy to take a phone call, take a meeting, whatever we can do to, to help with your uh, knowledge and depth in these areas. Um, and finally, this next slide is a is a is a list of the, actually this list also includes those of us who participate in the leadership and aging network. This is uh, really a voluntary group of folks who um, work in the aging space in one way or another, and uh, truly are are happy to be a resource to you. We find once again we want to thank you for your time and interest in attending this briefing on successful aging and community. A link with the recording of today's briefing and links to a variety of helpful resources will be emailed within the next two weeks to everyone registered on this morning's briefing. I do also want to take a moment to thank the staff at Mark, who have true who have who have put a lot of time and energy into making sure that this uh, briefing is 
is prepared both uh, from a from a depth and a technical standpoint, and we really could not put this on without their leadership and assistance. We hope you found today's briefing helpful. We're interested in knowing if an annual briefing on aging issues is helpful to you and topics of interest relating to aging services and livable communities. My name and contact information are on the slide. Please send me your suggestions. Please, please feel free to share topics you'd like us to cover in future briefings and how we can best support you in your very important work. Um, thank you and best wishes, wishes to each of you as we head into 2022 and the beginning of your legislative session. Thank you so much.